Good afternoon. I'm Bernie Del Rio and welcome to our webinar on corporate taxes in Mexico. We will be discussing this subject for approximately one hour and we'll have 15 minutes for questions and answers. You will see on the right hand side of your screen there is a tab that will open for you to ask your questions. We suggest that you send them during the course and they will be answered in the Q&A session. The recording of this webcast will be available on our website or upon request by email. Think of this as Mexican Corporate Taxes 101. We'll be covering the basics on Mexican corporate taxes such as the income and flat taxes and we'll also be covering the handling of VAT and profit sharing. The objective of today's talk is to give you a broad understanding of the different taxes that can affect your operation in Mexico and how best to plan for them. Of course, a one-hour seminar won't make you a tax expert but we do hope you come away with a better understanding of how things work and the major issues. As a note, taxes for payroll burden and other taxes will be covered in following webinars. And one of the things that we would like to ask you is, please, in your Q&As, let us know what other subjects are out there that you would like for us to, to create a webinar for you. And if we have enough feedback, we will definitely do so. For the index of what we'll be talking about, we'll be starting off with an overview of the tax system, then deal with the background rules for handling of different items and taxes, and then jump into the three main taxes we will be covering. Then we will talk about profit sharing. Now, this last one isn't really a tax, but since it does affect you at the corporate level, we do need to talk about it. And as a note, when you see EPS, many people think, think earnings per share, and here the, the acronym we're using is for employee profit sharing, so just uh, remember that. Now, th there are many different ways to set up shop in Mexico, and each will have their particular items. Mexico doesn't always have an easy way of doing things, as many of you may have noticed who have already dealt with Mexico. There are many uh, filings to be made and, and a lot of administrative burden compared to other countries. In this same line of thought, the, the thing to note is that Mexico ranks 107th out of 183 in the world for ease of paying taxes according to the World Bank. Now we have moved up in the world overall from 31st to 41st, up six spots from last year. This is a very interesting website, so please check it out. And if you take away the, the paying taxes part of the address, it leaves the overall report. Um, income tax. Now, as an overall, income tax is 30% for companies and for individuals, and the rate is a progressive table that goes up to 30%. This is an interesting item as compared to the U.S., for example, in that there is no tax on dividends. If dividends are paid to a shareholder on income that has already paid taxes at the corporate level, there are no withholdings that would apply to the dividends. Uh, the next tax, which is the, the corporate plate flat rate tax, this tax was basically created as an alternative minimum tax so as to limit tax planning for, for companies that didn't end up paying uh, income tax. And the last thing that we would talk about is that all Mexican companies have the legal obligation of distributing 10% of their worker of their profit to their workers. And the basis for, for that distribution is slightly different than from uh, income tax. And one of the things to note on the no tax for dividends, this is one of the reasons, for example, that you don't have transparent entities like you do in the U.S. 
like the LLC or, or the S Corp. Now, t tax legislation in Mexico is all codified, and taxes can affect your revenue, capital gains, and certain transactions. States or cities really do not have an income tax. Uh, and taxation is very, very heavily centralized in Mexico. Actually, for, for states, uh, the only significant tax that the states impose is the 2% payroll tax, which is a burden for the employer. And, uh, for example, for cities, uh, cities charge you real estate ownership tax, but one of the recommendations that the OECD and World Bank have uh, given to Mexico for years is precisely that Mexico is charging a whole lot less than it should when it comes to uh, city uh, land real estate tax as compared to the U.S. where all of your school system is is uh, paid for based on, on uh, city property taxes. Now, the first thing to note is Mexico is extremely formal, and, and you'll see, we'll, we'll be coming up with this all the time, is that in everything, invoices need to comply with a number of requirements. And so you, you have an invoice, and it needs to comply with 23 different requirements, and we will be having a webinar that you probably would have gotten the invitation for, that will talk about the different requirements that formally a, a deduction needs to comply with. A lot of the times, this is something that your staff in Mexico should be filtering, uh, but it isn't a bad idea for, for you in, in the U.S. to have an idea as to what that is. Now, if, if an expense does not comply with all of these uh, myriad of rules, it will not be deductible uh, for any of the taxes that we will see or be creditable for VAT. So, so that's an important thing to note, in addition to profit sharing, for example. Now, th this is a question uh, we, we've gotten often, and it's, when do I owe taxes? How, how, do they, how do I pay my taxes? And tax installments apply monthly, and you pay all of your taxes at the same time. Uh, you pay your withholdings, your corporate taxes, and what is paid separately is Social Security contributions and, and for example, your state taxes. But everything else that's federal is paid on one uh, monthly return. And all of these are paid on the bank website, so you do need Internet banking. And when this took place uh, quite a few years ago, it was a huge giveaway to the banks because any company that was a, a corporation had to have Internet banking uh, in order to pay their taxes. So all of a sudden, the banks got tons of new clients. Now, tax installments, as you can see, are due the 17th day of the, fall, of the following month. And most taxpayers get uh, some extra leeway, and, and it's based on the sixth number digit of your tax ID or RFC number, you get day 17 plus 1, day 17 plus 2, day 17 plus 3 business days. And all of this is business days. So it's day 17 plus 3 business days, and let's say it was Tuesday, I would get 3 business days, it would take me Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, so I would have to file on Thursday. Now, this doesn't apply to companies, taxpayers, that have the obligation to have their financial statements audited. And companies that, that have to have uh, be audited or, or opt not to be audited are, are the companies that have revenue for the previous year of around three point something uh, million dollars U.S. Uh, another 
company that wouldn't be able to apply this would be companies that consolidate for tax purposes and large taxpayers per, per the definitions uh, that the authorities have. Now, once you've paid everything in and it turns out the government owes you money, and, and here where is where I, I give you the commercial, and it's not to fret, Jay Del Rio is here and can help you get your money back. And we do that by one of two ways, and that's either we offset or we get a refund. And we love to do offsets. Offset really helps us out a lot in the sense that the government doesn't have to approve an offset. You, you tell the government, you owe, I owe you 100 pesos, and you owe me 50 pesos for value-added tax that I have in my favor, and I'll only pay you the net of the two. So you get immediate cash benefit. And the government can only audit you. So if they don't like what you're doing, they'll come in and audit you. All, all the contrary for a refund. Now, refunds, when you file a refund, and the government gives you a 40 working day term in most cases, like there are cases where, uh, for example, if you're an Emex company, it can be a, a shorter term. And a lot of it depends on does the government know you? Has the government budgeted you? If you think about this from the tax administrator's point of view, if you never ask for refunds and all of a sudden, you come up with a million dollar refund, some of the times they will have already budgeted their refund flow and that can be the cause of them not authorizing your refund. So the most important thing here is obviously uh, doing things right, uh, doing things on a timely basis. So if you have a refund or if you have a balance in favor every month, that's something that has to be addressed every month so you don't build up huge balances that, that are later harder to get back because you're asking for it all at once. So th that's, that's really the, the moral of the story is have the authorities get to know you. Your, your refunds are there every month. They understand that you're a solid, reputable company and you will have no issues. Okay, T talking about our first tax, which is the income tax. As a general overview, we would have, th the first item to talk about would be uh, depreciation is straight line. So th there are no other, no other methods for uh, depreciation, it's just the straight line method. Cost of goods sold is what is deductible. That didn't used to be the case in Mexico. It used to be purchases. Uh, but several years ago, I think it was probably 2005, uh, we changed the cost of goods sold. So just like you would have, for example, in the U.S., cost of goods sold is deductible. Uh, again, we're talking about the formal requirements that invoices need to comply with. We would also have, for example, inflationary accounting. And inflationary accounting is, is a whole lot of fun. And it's something I hope uh, people in the U.S. don't have to experiment themselves, is where we, we calculate based on liabilities and assets and whether by the passing of time, whether you've obtained a profit or a loss because of the real value of money when you pay something or you collect it. Um, thin cap rules are, are applicable in Mexico and they limit the amount of interest that you can charge uh, a company. We, we have 10 years for carry forward of losses. There is no carry back. And uh, lastly, transfer pricing rules apply. So anything that's going on between two related parties, so you have the mother company and the daughter company, all of those activities have to take place within what independent parties would have used.
Now, for typical non-deductibles, and, and here it is important to note that a lot of the times you're going to run into non-deductibles, and it's weird for a company not to have them. Like, obviously, if you're having significant non-deductibles, because you're getting caught up with the formal requirements, then that's a problem that, that needs to be addressed. In, in many times, it, it has to be addressed by training your staff to make sure that they know what they need to be asking for and Im implementing the procedures so that they do that. Now, uh, if you get caught up with restaurant expense, for example, is the government only allows you to deduct 87 point or to deduct 12.5 percent of your whole um, restaurant bill when you're not talking about travel. So if you're talking about uh, you took this very important client to dinner, that's the amount that the government would would want you to deduct. So it's uh, pretty ridiculous. Basically, not even pays for your tip. Uh, the next one is cars have a limit up to 175,000 pesos plus the value added tax on top of that. So if, if you buy a $50,000 car, part of it would not be deductible. Another one would be fringe benefits if they're not paid within the rules. And, and we do have a PDF that talks about uh, what those rules are. And the next item is cost of goods sold if you under-declare at the border for customs purposes. So let's say I bring in uh, uh, inventory and I say it's worth $100,000 and it's really worth $200,000 and my related party in the U.S. invoices me $200,000. Well, maybe financially I will cost that $200,000, but for customs purposes and for income tax purposes, it's going to be a double hit. For income tax purposes, it will not be deductible anything past that declared value of 100000 And for, obviously, for customs purposes, if you're doing this, you'd have a whole other slew of issues that, that would have to be addressed. Now, as we talked about, for tax installments, these would follow the general rules that you have to file monthly. Okay, and uh, we're, we're going to see an example now. And for January and February, we have uh, a tax ratio, which after the example will show you how, how you calculate that profit ratio. And where it says March, uh, there, there's a small asterisk. In this example, we're showing you like as if January through March were a full year. And if it was really the case, March's tax ratio would be changing. So let, let's dive into the example. Okay, so we have, uh, in January, we have 120 worth of revenue. Our profit ratio, which we'll see in the following slide, is 5.30%. So our estimated tax profit for January is 6.36. Now let's say I have 8.40 worth of tax losses from the previous year. There I can use my tax uh, carry forward, my NOLs, and apply that versus my estimated profit of 6.36 minus 6.36. My tax profit for the installment is zero. Now we're, we're going to jump to the next slide to see what happens for the rest of January. So I have a zero. I multiply times the tax rate of 30%. I get obviously zero. And uh, I have withholdings made to the taxpayer in the period. And, and this is interest on, on interest that the, the company makes. The banks will withhold income tax. So if you made 100 worth of interest, they would withhold per a certain formula, uh, the income tax, and let's say we get 
of income tax withheld, which acts as an installment that I can use against my taxes. So I would have 0.23. So my installment to be paid for January would obviously be zero. Now, if we go back to the to the February example, we have 90 of revenue for, for the month, 120 from the previous month, we would have 210 times the 5.30 again, times my estimate, would give me my estimated tax profit of 11.13, and I multiply that, or, or I subtract my, my tax loss, 8.40, so I would have a tax profit of 2.73. So I, I ate up all of my tax loss. Now let's go to the next slide. 2.73 times the 30% is 0.82. Now if I have 0.82 and I have withheld 0.46 because I had 0.23 from last month, and let's say I had another 0.23 from this month, so I have a total withheld of 0.46. The difference I have to pay to the government would be the 0.36. Now, if we go back to March, March would be the same deal. 100 plus 210 would give me the 310. We would have the profit ratio of 5.30, would give us 16.43, uh, and we would have a tax loss of 8.40. Uh, would give us a total of 8.03 times the 30% would give us the 241 minus the 0.36 that we paid in February, if you remember, and minus any withholdings to date. So I would have a net to pay of 1.36. So not very complicated. Okay. Profit ratio. And basically the point of, of determining a profit ratio is to say when, like, based on the previous year, and, and the most common scenario would be that you would take your previous year as your profit ratio year, is if I had a profit, for example, in 2010 of 440, I would I would divide that by my nominal revenue. And my nominal revenue is basically all of my accruable revenue for tax purposes minus any inflationary adjustments uh, would give me my nominal revenue. And that factor, that profit ratio, that would be what I would use to calculate my tax installments. Now, if you think about it, it it's a system that makes sense in the in that if I had a 10% profit last year, the government expects, well, pay in for tax purposes as if you would have a similar profit this year. So problems arise when you get uh, a very large uh, tax profit one year for some odd reason, and the next year your profit ratio decreases, then you will have overpaid. Okay. Uh, th this gives us just uh, an example of if you don't have a profit ratio for the, the previous year, you, you take the last year that, that uh, had a 12-month period, but it can't be more than five years prior to the one that you're paying. And during the first, second, and third months, uh, you'll, you'll take the profit ratio, even if it weren't for a 12-month period. Okay. And before you get too excited, it says here, okay, we get to apply a 28% tax rate. Uh, but the law in... in its annexes states that this 28% tax rate won't be applicable until 2014. And it, it should be 2010 th through 2012 at 30%, 2013, 29, 
2014-28. Now, the government can still come in like any legislators can and revoke this and leave the tax rate at the higher rate. Uh, as a note, Mexico did have the 28% rate previously, so uh, it is possible that they'll uh, take us back there. And one thing is, it really doesn't matter what type of company you create. You can be an SA to CV, which is like an ink or a corporation, or you can be an SDRL, which is more like an LLC, and your tax rate is exactly the same. Now, we've already seen the, the procedure uh, to, to calculate your tax installments. This would be an example of what happens on an annual basis. So if I have approval revenue of a fifteen hundred and my authorized deductions of sixteen fifty, uh, and I would have my deduction of eighty worth of employee profit sharing paid during the year. This is the paid profit sharing. So it would actually be the previous year's accrued profit sharing. That would give me zero base for the case number one. And for case number two, I would have the same 1500 My authorized deductions would be 900 I would have 40 worth of profit sharing. I would apply uh, tax losses, and I would still have my tax result. Now, if we look at that, uh, in case one, we would have zero times the 30%, obviously zero. Let's say I made installments during the year of 50, and I would have, I would end up uh, the year with a 50 peso balance in my favor that I can either get an offset or a refund. And in case number two, I would have 360 times the 30% would give me 108 minus the 50 that I paid in would give me 58. So if we were looking at two separate years here, year one and year two, I could even use that 50 to offset that 58. Okay, um, getting on to my favorite tax in the world. Corporate flat rate tax, or as we like to call it, the YETU. And as of January 1st, 2008, a new tax was established, and this is all in, in the legislative uh, minutes of why they, they did this tax. And, and the objective was to reward the production factors so that it would stimulate the economy and, and it would lead people to invest. and uh, since people were abusing uh, the income tax law and had found ways to get around the now defunct asset tax law, the government came up with a very weird flat tax that has the head of an income tax and the body of a value-added tax. But in the end, the real purpose of the corporate flat rate tax was to give your accountant and your controller constant headaches. So anyone who has dealt with the YETU will know that it's a big headache. Now, talking about the main characteristics, it, this tax substitutes the assets tax. It is intended to have a broader base than the income tax even though it has a lower rate, and it's cash flow based. And, and this is the main headache with this tax is precisely that it's cash flow based. And what, one of the theories of uh, implementing a flat tax, Mexico isn't the only country with a flat tax, is that it should be a minimum tax percentage and that it should be very simple and 
that it should substitute the income tax where, wherever it's implemented. And Mexico basically failed on all three accounts in that it's not very simple, it doesn't have a low rate, and it didn't really substitute the income tax. Now, the subject and object of the tax are, are similar to what we'll see for value-added tax. In it's any individual or corporation residing in Mexico would be subject to pay the corporate flat rate tax, and uh, foreign residents that, that uh, perform businesses in Mexico, if they sell goods, they render services, or uh, grant the temporary use or enjoyment of assets, which is leasing. So basically, everything would fall under those three categories. Uh, and all of this is determined based on the value-added tax law. So the rules, timing, etc., are based on the value-added tax law. Now, get, getting to the rate of said tax, the, the current rate is 17.5%. So as mentioned, uh, it was 16.5, went up to 17, and is now 17.5. And j just as a, a comment, the IRS, uh, for our American listeners, the IRS has ruled that the YETU, or flat tax, will be considered an income tax for credit purposes until they say otherwise. Now, they still haven't uh, given notice. They're, they're still analyzing this tax. They, they really don't know what to think of it. Uh, but some, something will, will end up being communicated by the IRS and the Mexican tax authorities. Now, re regarding the activities that are not subject to this tax, so the way the, the flat tax works is activities that aren't taxable on the revenue side will not be deductible on the expense side. So when the government says, for revenue purposes, royalties and interest in most cases will not be, a court, will not be considered revenue for this tax, the real objective there are per, um, going after is to make it so that royalties and interest are not deductible. So that, that's one of the main differences that we need to think about when talking about flat tax. Now, the obtaining of income uh, for the corporate flat rate tax Income is obtained when the con considerations corresponding to the activities are actually collected. So it's when things are collected. So again, cash flow base. And only in the case there are some special rules where only in the case of exports, if you haven't collected it within 12 months, you have to consider it revenue. Now, the installments you'll be paying, uh, just like we saw at the beginning, along with your income tax installments in, in the same deadlines. Now, these installments <coughs> will be calculated by taking the revenues you've collected to date. So if it's January, February, March, let's say we're in March, you would take March cumulative minus your deductions cumulative. So we'll be seeing uh, an example. And one of the most important things that I had forgotten to mention, uh, a pretty important item here, is salaries and social benefits. So your, your Social Security, Savings Fund, uh, all of that, uh, are not deductible for this tax. So we've seen that interest isn't deductible, royalties aren't deductible, and salaries and payroll burden wouldn't be deductible either. Now, the government does give you a, a credit for them. So it's, I don't make them deductible, but I give you a credit. 
for any taxable salary. So if you have fringe benefits, those would not give you a credit. Okay, so let's look at a quick example of uh, what this will look like. Now, we have revenue for January of 120 minus my authorized deductions that were actually paid of 135, I would have zero. So corporate flat rate tax would be zero for that month. Now, if we look at February, February has 250 year to date. So it's 250 total revenue collected minus 190, and I would have a tax basis of 60. That times my tax rate, 17.5, would give me the 10.5. Now, if we go to the next screen, uh, we would have our 10.5, and the government is giving, the, giving us 0.45 of a credit for salaries and Social Security paid for that period. So I have 0.45. And then I would subtract that 0.36 worth of tax installment that I had already made for income tax because you have to pay the greater of the two. So it's income tax or flat tax, whichever is greater. You don't pay both of them on a yearly basis, although on a, quarter or on a monthly basis, it can seem like you end up paying both of them. But on a yearly basis, which is when the, ca the calculation is actually made, you only pay the greater of the two. And as mentioned, we do not like Yetu, so we do everything in our power to make it so that you do not end up paying flat tax. Any flat tax that's paid uh, is a loss. And, and one of the things on the income tax side, if we've paid in income tax, that gives us the benefit of being able to uh, pay out the dividends tax-free. So uh, that's also why we like uh, income tax. Now, that 9.69 would be what we would actually pay out. Now, if we go back to March, we would have, let's say, revenue collected of 270 minus my authorized deductions of 260 and our tax basis would be 10. And if someone's looking at this, they would say, well, wait a second, it looks like uh, our tax base went down from the prior month, and how could that be? And one, one of the main things here is you need to make sure to pay your suppliers in your due dates. So if the end of the month comes, and a lot of the times if you're dealing with your related party, it's very easy to push back dates and not pay your, your obligations on time. And one of the things that happens then is that you would have all the revenue, but none of the corresponding deductions. So if I buy all of my product from my related party in France, and I do not pay uh, the French company for my product, then I don't have a deduction to offset against my revenue. So in this case, that's what happened in February, and it was righted in March, and so now my tax basis in March is lower. So I would have 10 times my 17.5 would give me 1.75. 1.75 minus my credit for salaries, 0.74, would give me 1.01, and since I've paid more than that in income tax, I take the credit up to 1.01. Okay, so that's an example of uh, what the, the corporate flat rate tax would look like. Uh, in, in this case, you can see it would be 9.69 in February and uh, no amount in January and no amount in March. Now, the next example, and just before I, I get into uh, all of this, if we did have that 9.69 in favor, we will be able to get that money back. 
So let's say January through March were the full year. And I ended up generating on a yearly basis income tax that's greater. If, if we look at the, the tables uh, shown, let's say my actual income tax was incredible because I mirrored what my installments were and I ended up with 1.72. And if I compare that to what my income, my flat tax would look like, after my credit for salaries, my income tax is greater. So all of the prepayments that I did for flat tax, that 9.69, I could get a refund for. So that's one of the reasons why, again, we mentioned that for a company, it's very important to watch their terms, pay things within their due dates. And if you have problems, you can even prepay, uh, let's say invoices aren't due yet, but you have a big flat tax problem, you can pay uh, invoices that aren't due yet. And so if, if we look at this combined example, it can give us a bit more of a visual effect of what the different taxes will look like, what I'm paying, and on an annual basis, uh, what, what I would have paid in for each tax. Now, jumping into our value added tax, value added tax applies all along the chain at every step on the full value of the operation. So it's not like a sales tax, which you would have in the US, where it only applies to the end seller, to the end customer. This is more like your European value added tax systems. Now, since 2002, value added tax is calculated on a cash flow basis. So again, we have uh, your income tax, which is accrual based. Obviously, your books will be accrual based. Your flat tax is cash flow based and your value added tax is cash flow based. So a lot of the complications that, that uh, ensue from handling all these different bases is what makes calculating taxes in Mexico a, a bit more complicated. Now, regarding the sale of goods, services rendered, or lease, taxes incurred when considerations or when I collect the money on each of them. And in case of imports, the import value added tax is due when I actually do the import. So that, that's something that you pay your custom broker. So you, you pay your custom broker and it's considered value added tax uh, in your benefit. Now, value added tax, like the flat tax, if you remember it, uh, who's subject to it? It's individuals and corporations that perform some of the following activities inside Mexico. So it's you sell goods, you render services, you lease, you, you permit the use of assets, or you import goods or services. And, and those are the four activities that, that would be subject to value added tax. Sixteen percent is the general value added tax rate. It's eleven percent at the border. Uh, it's zero percent when you were dealing with uh, patented drugs, food products, as well as any goods or services that are exported. Obviously, if you sold, if you make uh, boxes and you sell them uh, to Brazil. If you added on an extra 16%, that wouldn't make Mexico very competitive. So any exports are 0% rated. And there, for example, anything that's service related is very delicate and needs to be analyzed uh, very in a very detailed fashion to make sure that you do comply with that 0% rule. And you have 
exempt. And exempt is different than zero rated. It, it sounds like a technicality, but a company that has its revenue taxed at zero percent can get refunds for any value added tax that it pays out. But a, a company that has value added tax exempt sales, then you don't get anything back. Now, in order to determine your value added tax, the tax will again be calculated every month and it is considered a definite tax each month. So it's not yearly like your other income or flat taxes. The tax again must be paid via internet within 17 days uh, according to the calendar we saw. Payment will be the difference between the tax that's collected and the tax that's paid. And uh, the taxpayer will deduct, there, there are situations where you have value added tax withheld and those will again be uh, a deduction for you or a credit. And regarding of imports of tangible goods, what we've discussed, taxes will be paid at customs through your broker. Now, value added tax cannot be paid on a consolidated basis, even if you do consolidate uh, in Mexico for income tax purposes. Now, when, when there is a positive balance in your favor, let, let's say you have an amount you pay, you pay in, and value added tax in 99% of uh, companies should always be a balance sheet item. That, that's one of the important things. It's not a profit and loss item. It's not something you should budget in your P&L uh, or in your forecast. And it's, it's a balance sheet item and once you, let, let's say if you're a taxpayer because your service is taxed and you make money, then you'll be paying value added tax to the government and that's a good thing. You will have financed yourself for a, a close to a month off of your clients who will have paid you the value added tax and you then pay it to the government. And if you're a, an export oriented company or if you're zero rated, you will not have any value added tax collected so you'll be generating value added tax in favor. And there you can credit any amounts that you have in favor against following months. So if it's a fluke thing, uh, you can offset it against following months, or you can offset the, the, the amounts against any other amounts that are owed uh, for federal taxes, as long as it's the total of set amount. Uh, now, if, if you do have a remaining balance, you can ask for a refund. And again, if you, have, uh, if you don't have anything to offset it against, you can get a refund. And the important thing here is, you can't obviously double dip and get uh, a credit and get a refund. This is a simple example of uh, the procedure to calculate the monthly uh, final payment. So let's say we had VAT collected of 256 minus the creditable VAT paid of 192 would give us 64, and so we would owe the government 64 in that month. Okay, and all of the creditable VAT paid would be including your, your value added tax paid on imports. In the second scenario, I have zero, I have creditable VAT paid of 144, so I would have a positive balance of 144 owed to me. Now let's say in March, I collected 321 worth, worth of VAT, uh, paid out 152, I would owe 169. I can take that 144 from the previous month and just pay the difference of the 25. So uh, when I look at it like that, it's not that complicated. Actually preparing the, the tax installment is a bit more because things do need to be cash flow based. Uh, and a lot of the times systems can help us out so that we can automate some of these processes so that you can generate a report 
from your system. That that's where that's really where you need to go if you have a large volume of activities. So if tons of transactions, we we really need to look at ways to automate and and base ourselves off of uh, systems and reports. And our last subject is employee profit sharing. Now, employee profit sharing is a statutory right of the employees. It's in the Constitution, so it's very well protected. And it applies to all workers who perform a subordinated personal uh, job. So they, they did, they acted like workers, they, they were workers, and they have the right to share in the profits of the company they work for. Now, <coughs> employees must de deliver profit sharing within 60 days following the date on which the company filed or must have made the filing in May. So the, the due date so that you write it down is May 31st uh, of the following year. Now, the, the employee profit sharing is uh, distributed to all the employees. So let's say I, I have a uh, million dollars worth of profit and times 10% would be $100,000. And that $100,000 would be split between the employees based on uh, the, the salary levels and uh, days worked in the year. So if a, a person showed up that made a very high salary the last day of the year, they would not get uh, a huge amount of profit sharing because it would be uh, prorated out depending on number of days. And uh, a thing to note is which companies are exempt from the obligation to, dis to distribute profits to its workers and its newly created companies during their first calendar year of operation and newly created companies that make a new product, although that's not uh, very common, and you have some other cases. Now, one of the things that I don't remember if I did uh, mention is that in Mexico, everything is calendar year. There are no fiscal years, so it's January through December for every year. All companies in Mexico are calendar year. And uh, it used to be because uh, companies would play around uh, with purchases, since purchases were what was deductible rather than cost of goods sold. And um, I, I guess the authorities don't want to give us too much leeway. So as you can imagine, it's not, uh, it's quite a burden during the first three months of the year, which is when taxes erode on a corporate basis. So there are no extensions. Uh, there are no extensions. All we can do is amend returns. So all companies have to be filed uh, no later than 31st of March. And since all companies are calendar year, that's why, that's why we have a lot of work during January through March. And one of the reasons we, we try to create pre-closed numbers as of September or October so that we have the greatest visibility of what the status of the company is and can take actions if actions need to be taken before the close of the company. Now, get, getting back onto uh, profit sharing, uh, here, is an example of uh, how to calculate profit sharing and it's total taxable income uh, minus the deductions times the 10 percent would be 35.5 okay and one of the the, the main difference between uh, your income tax base and your profit sharing base will be that it doesn't consider inflationary accounting for profit sharing Okay.
And five minutes ahead of schedule, we are available for any questions and answers that you may have. So we're going to be putting the, those up on screen. Okay, um, one of the questions, what is the best method to fund um, Operations Mexico when your headquarters is located in the U.S.? Capital contribution versus loans. Um, if you require deposits for your orders, etc. You still utilize, okay. Um, the structure issue depends what you're trying to get at. So if what you're trying to get is to lower your tax base in Mexico versus the U.S. And one of the first things to remember is Mexico's tax rate is 30 percent. Mexico U.S. tax rate is 35 and can go uh, higher with state taxes. So uh, we really do need to look at this with a global uh, point of view in mind. So. Here you have thin cap rules, which are three to one. So you can have a loan of, let's say I have capital of 30. If I have three to one, I can have a loan of 90 and I won't have any problems. So I can have a loan of 90 and the interest that would, would uh, proceed from that would be totally deductible as long as I'm handling market rates for all the amounts. So I, I think what, what's best for one company might not be the best for another. Now another question is if you require deposits for your orders, example 25 percent down at the date of order, do you still have to utilize the electronic invoicing system? And yes you do have to, to invoice uh, uh, a deposit. Now that, that can be tricky, it depends on how, like if, if it's a large amount, if it makes sense uh, structuring a contract. So, so I think that would be our particular uh, case. Now, uh, at what level does the Mexican authorities require you to have a transfer pricing study? It's 13 million pesos, so that's about one point uh, like one million dollars revenue on the prior year. Now, since refunds are hard to get, do you recommend being conservative and in making installments? Now, you really can't, like the, the tax installments are, tax installments are a calculation that's in the law. So you, you have the calculation that you have to comply with. And there are cases where, I, I believe it's the middle of the year, if you can forecast out that you, you will be overpaying your taxes. And this is why it's so important uh, for us to have as much information as possible in having uh, your forecast, your budgets for the rest of the year, for next year. If we have that information, we can work with you to see exactly what the best way to uh, reduce your taxes could be. So if you have, uh, if you will have overpaid your tax installments, there is an option to reduce it uh, for the remainder of the year. Now, uh, since refund, okay. The, the interest withholding, if, if you do end up paying uh, flat tax and you had an interest withholding by the bank, 
uh, income tax withholding by the bank, that would be considered a tax installment and you would be able to get it back. So, so there, isn't, uh, uh, there isn't a problem there. Uh, can we get an email copy of the webinar PowerPoint? Yes, you can. Uh, uh, we will send it to anyone who requests it. Um, we will also include it on the website. And we will be inaugurating a, a new website probably within 15 to 20 days, which will make it much more user-friendly and, and easier to get to the information that, that you like. Uh, uh, what, what is inflationary accounting? Um, I, I started to um, talk about inflationary accounting in, in let, let's say you have a loan of 10 million pesos and you owe that loan to the bank um, or, or to whoever, let, let's say to, to your shareholder and they charge you a 2% interest. So it's 10 million peso loan and for example, inflation for the year was 5%. And, and inflation for the year in Mexico is probably around 3.5 or 4%. So let's use a real example. So if it's a 10 million peso loan and you have a 4% uh, inflation rate, if you pay that same 10 million at the end of the year, you will have really paid 4% less than the nominal value of that uh, loan. So what the government says is, give us, uh, give us, consider as revenue for tax purposes, 400,000 on that loan of uh, 10 million pesos. And obviously if you have large account receivables, that would create a loss. So here, the important thing is, and, and it gets back to our question of how to structure, uh, how to structure your taxes on a uh, financing point of view. If you include it as capital, it doesn't generate that uh, tax profit on inflation. But if you gen if you categorize it as a loan, it would. So you you just have to make sure that you're not generating uh, that you're not generating any tax basis that really um, uh, that re really wouldn't apply okay I have another question here on Maquila companies or emix export uh, for refunds uh, the rule used to be that it would be five days. Now the government would give it back to you in 20. So uh, 20 working days. And again, the, the most important thing is for them to get to know you so that they have you budgeted, so that they understand that you're a, an honest taxpayer. And they, they most tax administrations get, uh, get to know you and uh, budget you and, and are fine. So 20 days. Now those periods can be interrupted if you do have, like if the government requests more information, those 20 days can be stopped. Uh, can flat tax installments be applied against income tax due? Yes, they can, according to the example we saw. Uh, we kind of saw it the other way around, but uh, flat tax installments on a yearly basis can be applied uh, against your your income tax due. Now, uh, um, I'm I'm getting a lot of funding questions, which actually makes me want to generate a whole webinar on just funding. Uh, again, if you have, for example, a Maquila company, and you generate revenue and you bill your related party wh wherever that is and, and your related party uh, funds you, any of the funds that, 
that uh, they send down would be considered a, uh, an advance on your service or a loan. So we would have to uh, consider them as reducing that account payable. So yes, you, you, you would reduce that account payable. Uh, transfer pricing study, uh, who, do, who does a transfer pricing study? We, uh, transfer pricing is kind of a voodoo art, and uh, we do not do transfer pricing studies. Uh, transfer pricing studies are done usually by economists, and it's very, very specialized. If someone does need a transfer pricing study, we can sure, certainly send you uh, the way of uh, a competent uh, provider. Um, what else? Does the loan have to be a specific interest rate? The interest rate has to be determined based on market value. So if, if, in, if the interest rate would be five per, a range of between, let's say, four and six percent, according to a transfer pricing study, then that's what you should charge uh, the, the related party. Now, obviously, it depends what term. Like, it's not the same thing to loan someone money for 20 years or for two years payable each month. So the, the timing of, of the payments will be important. The currency, like, if it's in pesos, your, your interest rate will usually be a lot higher than if it's in dollars. So all, all of those things are important when uh, calculating, uh, calculating your interest rate. I'm just looking over to see if we've gotten out all of the questions. Uh, what, what to do regarding, uh, for example, client gifts? Uh, I, I saw a question. Uh, if, if you do have, for example, promotional uh, let, let's say you make, uh, I don't know, uh, coffee mugs and you make uh, T-shirts and, and stuff like that. Is that considered deductible? Yes, it would be. If, if, if you give it, give it out, it's promotional material. There, there shouldn't be any problem there. If, uh, if you have, uh, for example, if, if I had a, uh, a policy in which I gave uh, all of my clients that bought uh, more than $5 million worth of product, and I said, uh, I'm going to give them a flat screen TV, there, there is criteria that we could consider that as if, if you have a group of people that comply with certain mechanisms to get uh, uh, to get some uh, object or, or some gift, if if you have a standard uh, procedure like that, that can be looked at to see to make it deductible. So so that that is an interesting uh, item. And I think if we don't have any more questions, uh, we're going to cut it off here. And and please let us know either by email or. Uh, by uh, uh, your comments here if you do have any other uh, topics that you would like us to discuss. So uh, we thank you for your participation and are glad to help with any issues or questions you might have regarding this or other items. Thank you and have a great afternoon.